So now uh, we'll stay in the same poll. We'll stay in Antarctica with our third speaker, with Dr. Rob Mason. He's the principal research scientist of the Australian Antarctic Division in Tasmania, Australia, where he studies the sea ice environment using satellite sensors and other data. Today he will talk about today he will talk about change and variability in Antarctic sea ice implications and challenges. Uh, take a, take it away, Rob. Okay, can uh, can everyone see me? Can you see the slide there, Joey? Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Cynthia, and thank you, Gay, and uh, thank you indeed for inviting me to participate in this wonderful um, occasion. Uh, and congratulations, Joey. It's an amazing achievement. I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here. Um, Joey has uh, had a major influence on me both personally and professionally for almost 40 years, how time flies. And I owe him a very great deal. Um, he was instrumental in my PhD work. And then I had the great privilege of being mentored by him for three years as postdoc at NASA Goddard. So um, for me, this was a, an ex extraordinary experience and I'm eternally grateful for, to Joey on many, many levels. Uh, not least for his kindness, his willingness to pass on his immense knowledge and his great insight into everything to do with sea ice. Um, needless to say, I hold Joey in very high esteem. I, I believe he's an inspirational man of great wisdom, knowledge and integrity. And I know I'm not alone in feeling this. And uh, it's with some humility that I now present on Antarctic sea ice change and variability, because this is a field in which Joey is really a a giant. So uh, I'll just sorry, the slide is stuck here. So ah, there we go. I'll start off with uh, why sea ice is important. Well, Claire and um, Arnold have already covered this to a large extent in their wonderful talks. And this, uh, in this talk, I'll concentrate first and foremost on Antarctic sea ice. So as Claire said, first up, um, in summertime, it covers uh, approximately 3 million square kilometers around the Antarctic continent, the continent itself. The ice sheet is about 14 million square kilometers. But uh, leading into winter, this uh, area expands tremendously up to about 19 million square kilometers. And, and the, the reasons behind this are the complex interplay of temperatures, winds, ocean currents, and also interactions with the ice sheet. So the ice, the sea ice is very, very sensitive to change and variability in each of these factors. And as Claire said, again, first up, um, the sea ice is tremendously important, both locally, regionally, and um, globally, because it plays a pivotal role in the weather and climate systems. Um, Claire already showed that it's highly reflective, the sea ice. There's a very strong feedback between um, the albedo and the, and the temperature of the surface. So much of the incoming solar radiation is reflected back out to space to maintain the coldness of the surface. And it's also a strong insulative barrier to atmosphere ocean interactions. And just showing what Arnold was, was uh, showing in his talk previously, that when the sea ice forms, it injects tremendous amounts of brine into the underlying ocean. And when it melts at, in a different season, it injects uh, pulses of fresh water into the ocean. And this uh, affects, strongly affects ocean properties and circulation. You can see the map here is of uh, overturning circulation uh, around the globe in the ocean. And you can see the processes that occur in Polinias and other areas around Antarctica really do have a strong influence on other parts of the ocean globally. 
Uh, it also, sea ice plays a dominant role in ecosystems, marine ecosystems around Antarctica. It concentrates phytoplankton, microalgae, into the ice, and this forms a food source for krill, which then form a food source for penguins, and whales, and seals around. And also, sea ice can mess up shipping. It can be a real problem to shipping, as seen in this photograph from 1915. It had a dramatic effect on the endurance expedition of Shackleton, and in fact, enclosed the ship and ended up sinking it. And a hundred years later, I'm showing a, a slide, um, a picture on the right there of the Aurora Australis. It's the Australian icebreaker, which is parked off David Station just uh, in East Antarctica. And it's using the sea ice as a, as a landing bay to offload uh, material to transport to the station. So why is measuring, monitoring, understanding, or predicting sea ice important? Well, it's, uh, sea ice is a sensitive indicator and a modulator of climate change and variability. And sea ice change has serious wide ranging consequences for not only climate, but also weather ecosystems. And I'll show the ice sheet and also society and humans as well. Sorry, my screen is stuck again. Sorry about this. Ah, oh, yes, there we go. So uh, it's a major challenge to measure and understand the sea ice in such a vast, remote, and highly dynamic and interactive system around Antarctica. Um, this, it's, it's wonderful to have a challenge, of course, and uh, the basis of this is that Sea ice covers a wide range of scales of interest. On the smaller scale, which is uh, microns to millimeters, you're looking at the microstructure of the sea ice and then you go up to um, 100 to 1,000 kilometer kind of scale. And this is the kind of satellite view of the uh, polar sea ice that Claire and uh, Arnold were talking about. So how do we get around this? Well, we have to use a strategy of in situ information going into the field on icebreakers and carrying out process studies as well. And we attempt to extend this by remote sensing and modeling also plays a key role in, it, in enabling us to pull together and synthesize our observations. And what I'm gonna talk a little bit about is the crucial role of uh, autonomous technologies, this new exciting field, which is enabling us to bridge the scales between our in-situ observations and the satellite. So coming back to um, the large scale picture, what are the recent findings? Well, Claire has already talked about this. This is the aerial extent of sea ice since 1979. It's really the satellite passive microwave area but I'd like to rename that the Camiso era. And of course, Claire and others have played a big role in this. And this is a plot on the left-hand side from uh, Claire's wonderful PNAS paper of 2019, where it's showing that there's about, there's a minor increase, a modest increase over the period uh, 1979 to 2018 of about 1% per decade in sea ice overall around Antarctica. Uh, I'd also like to point out that Joey has published a tremendous paper as well in Journal of Climate in 2017 showing similar patterns. But while the plot shows the overall pattern, Antarctic sea ice is quite, um, quite a challenge in the sense that there are differing regional and seasonal contributions to this overall trend. So around East Antarctica and in the Weddell Sea, there are positive trends. And in the Ross Sea, there's quite a strong positive trend as well. But in the amundsen bellingshausen Sea, it's quite a strong negative trend. And as, um, and as uh, Claire and also uh, Arnold pointed out, um, things were going along quite nicely up until about 2012, then all of a sudden, sea ice shifted upwards quite dramatically, and in 2014, it surpassed uh, 20 million square kilometers for the first time in the satellite data record. But then there was this strong plummeting down 
of overall sea ice extent. And it's quite a quandary and quite a mystery that a lot of people are looking into. And Joey published with uh, John Turner this really interesting paper in Nature Comment in 2017, which uh, sets the scene for solving this puzzle that's occurring in Antarctic sea ice. So one, another way to look at Antarctic sea ice change is in the duration of the sea ice season. This is something that Claire has done in the past. And this, again, we rely very heavily on the work that Claire and, and uh, Joey in particular have, have done in, in providing us with satellite passive microwave data. So this is looking at the trend in sea ice duration using the passive microwave data record. You can see here that there's a mixed signal around much of Antarctica. Positive is uh, where there's a longer duration, and this is in days per year. So the reds, the yellows, and the oranges are positive, and more the blues and the mauves, etc., over this side are negative. And you can see while there's been strong positive signal in the Ross Sea, an increase in duration west of the Antarctic Peninsula, it's just it's been the opposite signal. And why is this important? Well, one thing is that change in sea ice duration, less duration exposes the, uh, the ocean. It opens up the ocean and exposes it to the atmosphere. And there have been strong ecosystem responses to this, um, this change. Um, for instance, uh, a long-term ecological research study at Palmer Station has shown some climate migration in the penguins living there. Um, you can see that around about 1990, the penguins were dominated by Adelis there. In fact, they were virtually the only penguin species to be living there. But due to loss of sea ice over, this, over the subsequent decades, the daily population plummeted quite significantly. And lo and behold, chin straps and gentoo penguins came in. These are, these are sub-Antarctic species rather than ice-loving species. And now the gentoo penguin makes up about half the population in, uh, in Palmer Station. Uh, another thing is that there's been some coincidence between um, the sea ice loss uh, around the Antarctic Peninsula region and the ice shelf, the disintegration of ice shelves there. Now, this, uh, these images on the right-hand sh side show the Larsen B ice shelf in early 2002 with no sea ice buffer offshore. And soon afterwards, the whole thing disintegrated. And a paper in 2018 that we put together suggests that the, lock, the lack of sea ice may have something to do with this in the sense that it opened up the vulnerable ice shelf margins to ocean swells, which then flexed the outer margins and eventually broke them up to release um, weakened ice shelf behind. And uh, this, is, this was quite an, um, an extraordinary occurrence in the sense that over 3000 square kilometers of ice shelf was lost in less than two weeks. And this ice shelf had been in place for the approximately 10,000 years prior to this. And this is important because once ice shelves disintegrate or thin, then they, they're not able to buttress the amount of ice that's coming into the ocean from the continent. And so this kind of event leads to an increase in sea level. So while we know a lot about, or a reasonable amount about the aerial extent of, uh, of sea ice in both uh, in the Antarctic and the way that's changing and varying, varying. One thing we don't know is whether the sea ice and its snow cover thickness is changing. And we rely very heavily on satellite altimeters. They're the key to enabling us to uh, measure this and monitor this on a large scale. But this is a challenge around Antarctica. Now, the laser altimeter will measure the distance between the spacecraft and the surface, and then, as a reference, the distance between the, uh, the spacecraft and the sea level rise. And by Archimedes' principle, you can plug in uh, those measurements. And if you have independent data on the snow thickness and the density of the snow and the density of the ice, then you can derive um, information about the overall sea ice thickness. But 
this is a major challenge, as I said, and we need in independent uh, data for calibration and validation. So this is where a lot of the work that we do now, and I go into the field fairly often on our icebreaker, this shows an experiment from 2007 in East Antarctica. We go into the field, we collect localized baseline in situ measurements. Shown here is our icebreaker, the Aurora Australis, and people um, flailing around on the ice, acquiring data on snow and ice properties and thickness over 100 to 200 meter um, kind of scales. And we attempt to extend this by carrying out then measurements of that region and over larger regions by helicopter and plane. And that, that helicopter there had a scanning laser EM induction, snow radar, and cameras, and that would cover the order of 100 kilometers. Now, we also increasingly use autonomous technologies. These are really opening up an amazing amount of new information on the complex sea ice environment, particularly from below. And this uh, introduces an exciting new era. On the left at the top, you can see a scanning laser Underneath is, is, a, uh, is a GPS probe for snow thickness. And then under that, you've got a, a, an autonomous mini submarine type thing that's got a multi-beam sonar on it. So if you put all of these data sets together, you get quite an unprecedented uh, detailed view of the sea ice. And the importance of this is shown in the uh, graph on the right there. Uh, you can see the drilling and ship measurements uh, underestimate the total thickness of sea ice that's shown by the AUV from below. And in addition, we use unmanned airborne vehicles. Um, these, these can extend again over kilometers and we like to use longer range AUVs and drones where possible. This is uh, sort of the future, what we want to do that can cover hundreds of kilometers. And just to point out that none of this is new, that um, in JGR Oceans in 1991, Joey Camiso and Peter Wadhams, who is also talking later on, um, carried out a similar study in the Arctic. They were on to this way ahead of, of us, and we've, we've got a lot to learn from these earlier studies. So uh, coming up to the end now, we've got exciting new um, opportunities on the horizon. I'm just showing you here a uh, new Australian icebreaker. This is an artist's impression of the RSV New Inia, which is a, um, an Aboriginal word, Tasmania Aboriginal for Aurora Australis. And this, as we speak, is coming down to us, um, to Australia. It was built in Europe and is on its way down. When it op open up uh, a new era of being able to measure sea ice around Antarctica. So in summary, there have been major advances thanks in large part to the work of Joey and Claire and others in terms of giving us a wonderful array of satellite observations. Without those satellite data, it would have been impossible for us to look at the large scale picture of what Antarctic sea ice is doing. But there are, main, there are challenges that remain. And these are based around the nature, the drivers and the effects of change variability in the Antarctic and it's actually a sea ice, atmosphere, ocean, ice sheet system. And also there are challenges around modeling and forecasting and prediction. And there are current discrepancies in uh, what climate models are showing and what the observations are telling us. So there's a crucial role of remote sensing. Again, please, Joey, continue to work in the field and provide your wisdom and information on this. And these need to be coordinated with observations, cross-disciplinary process studies, modeling, and these are built very much on strong collaboration. And uh, sorry, I didn't have a chance to go into um, the drivers of change and variability that's occurring in, in Antarctic sea ice. This is a complex field, as, as Arnold and Claire said, but I'm just giving a pointer here to three publications. The top one is a review from the National Academies of Sciences. Then I point you very strongly to um, Joey's uh, paper from 2017 and also Claire's paper from 2019 there. Once again, happy birthday, Joey, and a huge thank you um, for all you've done for me and not only me, but for the field um, of uh, research, which is a very exciting field. Um, I'd also like to thank Peter Wadhams, who's been uh, 
tremendous person in my life also in the past, as has Claire Parkinson and Manfred Langer and Arnold Gordon. And actually I show here a picture I took on my first expedition to Antarctica in 1986, which I shared with Joey and Arnold was chief scientist on that. And Peter and Manfred were also on that. And it was the first time um, an icebreaker had been into the um, Antarctic sea ice to carry out experiments in the winter time. I'd also like to thank all other speakers and also um, particularly Gay and Cynthia for putting this together and for inviting me. And thank you, I always put a picture of my children, forgive me, on every presentation. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Professor, uh, Dr. Mason.